started the recording. So, uh, welcome everybody uh, for the roundtable on the levers of change for effective disability inclusion, economic empowerment. I'll just take you through more the uh, why we are here together and what we would like to present to you as a, a solutions community of the Zero Project. Um, we are here together with uh, with Anneke Maertz, Simon Brown, and also Masudul Haq. They will also be part of this roundtable discussion and they will present and also uh, give their, uh, their their explanations about uh, their experiences uh, after uh, my first introduction. So economic empowerment, uh, what do we actually mean by it? Uh, so what we generally see as the problem is that persons with disabilities experience much higher rates of unemployment and underemployment than non-disabled people. Uh, especially women with disabilities, uh, we see that they are particularly disadvantaged and that's re yeah, that's really problematic. We, when we talk about economic empowerment, we really take a, a very broad definition. It's not only uh, formal employment, uh, it's not only uh, the formal job market, we, we also would like to include the, the informal job market, wage employment, self-employment, entrepreneurship, both in rural and urban settings. So when we're talking about economic empowerment, uh, also during the roundtable meeting, this is not only uh, the formal employment. Uh, two ver very important international frameworks are, are relevant and when we talk about inclusive economic empowerment, and that is article number 27 on work and employment from the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities as well as the Sustainable Development Goal number eight, which promotes inclusive and sustainable economic growth, employment, and decent work for all. Uh, both the CRPD as well as the Sustainable Development Goals are being um, supported and even part of the, uh, the legal framework when it comes to the CRPD of many, many countries. So the challenge what we see is how do we ensure uh, that people with disabilities have an equal socio-economic opportunities to make a decent living? And that's actually the challenge that we have formulated for ourselves also as the solutions community and where we would like to, yeah, to find an answer to together. Yeah. So if you look at the, the arena, as I can call it, uh, of economic empowerment, we see a lot of different stakeholders. We have persons with disabilities themselves, of course, but also their, their family members, the broader community. Um, when they uh, go for training uh, to, to get a skill to, to, to gain more abilities to, to do uh, work, and they also engage with uh, vocational training institutes. Uh, sometimes people with disabilities are part of organizations of persons with disabilities. There are companies, business networks, microfinance institutes for access to finance. Uh, ministries pay a role, donors, civil society organizations, many organizations uh, uh, that are actually part of that arena when it comes to promoting uh, economic empowerment for people with disabilities. So within this ecosystem, uh, all those organizations interact and also influence each other. Uh, so where do we actually start when we talk about inclusive uh, 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 economic empowerment? What we see is there are both barriers to people with disabilities to become active actually in terms of economic empowerment and also disablers. Um, um, so barriers and disablers and as well as enablers. And um, I, I often use what I call ACAP. It's about attitude, it's about communication, it's about accessibility and it's about participation. And you can actually both apply it for barriers as well as enablers and they affect actually at different levels uh, at an individual level uh, program level organizational level and institutional level so uh, for persons themselves but also in let's say in the uh, at, at the different levels where they interact and also when we talked about the stakeholders and how the stakeholders interact also those different levels of barriers but also enablers play a big role 
change happens one person at a time, eh? but how to get such a system in motion to make a whole system actually inclusive of persons with disabilities when it comes to economic empowerment. Uh, when you look across the different initiatives that are there uh, globally, uh, we see that there are many different uh, models that are being that are underpin actually uh, these interventions of change. Uh, you have the Breck graduation model. Uh, Masudul will uh, will talk more about that. Uh, we have the Cotter eight steps on organizational change. Annika will be able to refer to that. We have the cr creative capacity building design processes. We have a process really about behavior change. Also, Simon will uh, talk a bit more about that. Uh, that are really underpin actually the, the change that we seek to achieve uh, through our interventions. Uh, interesting would be uh, in our round table of today, what are the different levers of change? Where do we start? Uh, where do we actually make a difference? We cannot work with all those uh, stakeholders uh, in the in the arena of economic empowerment. So where do we start uh, and and where do we invest our limited resources, time and energy? Uh, so as I said, we have three uh, roundtable uh, panelists for today, Anneke Maertz, uh, Simon Brown uh, and Masudul Haq. Anneke works with Light for the World as Technical Director on Economic Empowerment and is also Country Director in Uganda. Uh, Simon Brau is the uh, global lead on the economic empowerment uh, of site savers and also very much involved in inclusion works and an uh, inclusive futures program. And Masudul Haq works um, in uh, uh, as operational manager in uh, with humanity and inclusion in, in Bangladesh. And has a very uh, deep understanding of the, the Brak uh, graduation model. So the questions that I would like to to uh, uh, to actually discuss with you, Anik, uh, Simon, and, and Masudul is are actually threefold. So if we look at the levers of change, yeah, and I tried to kind of bring in uh, a bit of a, an, an introduction. How did you get started uh, with your initiatives uh, that you tried to sort of start up to actually increase the Level, yeah, increase the, the economic opportunities for people with disabilities. What did you do first? Uh, how did you try to actually balance between building a program for lasting impact and at the same time you cannot sort of do it all together at once? Um, what did you see like were the enablers uh, in, in the program when you sort of developed it further uh, after the startup? Uh, and how do you manage sort of to give to give that more sort of oxygen, give more attention to it so that it can grow? And what are the biggest uh, biggest uh, challenges that you that you faced? And, and how did you overcome them? And I think that's also part of the the success actually of a lot of the programs that not we will encounter often a lot of challenges. But how do we deal with them? <laughs> So I would be very interested to, to, to hear from you and uh, your experiences. And um, I'm sure also the, the audience and the participant, other participants in this, uh, um, uh, uh, during this, this session would be very much interested. So for the rest of the, the audience, I would like to, you to encourage to uh, also be very active during the, the round table. Uh, when Anneke, uh, Simon and Masudu present. So if there is something that you really like, put in the chat box, wow, uh, and put there, there uh, an exclamation or a remark what you really liked about what it has been said. If there is something that you sort of gives you an insight, uh, you can put aha and then actually, uh, now I understand that this and this and this. Uh, so that actually you make a sort of a translation of what the story of Aneko or Simon or Masudul uh, means for you personally in terms of your own work. And hmm, could be an exclamation to say, okay, I would like to understand a little bit better. So by doing this, we would also be able to kind of get your responses and also take them up during the question and answer uh, 
part of this session today. So this is it for, for me right now. I'm handing uh, gladly over to, uh, to Annika. Thank you very much, Sander, and great to be part of this uh, round table. Yes, what makes an effective strategy to create impact for persons with disabilities? That was exactly the question we asked ourselves when we started with a project that was called the Livelihood Improvement Challenge. It was a great project because um, the donor gave us lots of freedom to actually um, address some of the barriers that young people with disabilities are facing in Uganda in accessing livelihood opportunities. It also created us with, with indeed a challenge because we thought, you know, there must be a way to do it better and we have to find it. Um, so that's how we started with quite an open eye and, and a lot of willingness and commitment to maybe come up with something different. Next slide, please. So um, how did we start? Actually, we start quite, um, let's say, traditional. We did um, a scoping study, we did focus group discussions with a lot of persons with disabilities. We had uh, workshops and meetings with disability structures, but we felt a bit stuck because not so many new ideas were coming up. So we thought, OK, we have to step out of this box and, and also do it differently. So we organized uh, a learning expedition, as we called it at that moment. Um, we came together with four change makers with different types of impairments, with two practitioners and with a journalist. And we went out there to visit um, successful practices to create um, livelihood uh, opportunities, employment for young people in general. So we looked at um, practices of um, of, of organizations that focused on persons with disabilities, but also organizations that focused on young people in general. And we look, okay, what really works uh, for young people to get them into, um, into work, actually? So um, we heard a lot of different stories, and it was great that the young people were actually in the lead to organize those days. And um, yeah, we learned, for example, that um, a young person with a physical impairment mentioned, you know, if they can, and he actually mean, meant other young people, I also can, why not? Um, and on the other hand, we heard like, yeah, there are many young people with disabilities, but you know, they can't do such work as I'm doing. This was a farmer. So there were so many assumptions going around, um, but also a lot of commitment actually to become more disability inclusive. Next slide, please. So um, after that learning expedition, uh, we came together again with the same young people uh, with disabilities and we, we had a five day pressure cooker session where we looked at, OK, what can we do? What kind of idea can we come up with? And that is how we came up with uh, Make 12.4% Work. It's an initiative that brings different actors together. Um, in a kind in a commitment to become more inclusive in their practices. Those actors are um, employers, companies, um, livelihood organizations, can be skills development organizations, all focusing one way or the other on um, economic developments. So we had this vision that we wanted to bring together in within two years, 124 actors in their commitment around disability inclusion. So we thought big. We also said, um, okay, we have to create urgency. So we have to create a, a pull factor for organizations and for companies to be willing to become part of this network. So we, we developed business cases. Uh, we had a pitch around the, the SDGs of leaving no one behind. Um, we talked about the donor climate. Um, yeah, so that's how we created urgency and the pull factor. Next one, please. We also um, looked at building a powerful coalition. We thought we have to bring together at least 12 ambassadors to start this network. Um, those ambassadors were companies, were organizations that were already inclusive in their practices. So we thought that they can create this pull factor. And, and link up with their peers to become part of this um, network. 
And we said it's very important that we have the management commitment of those organizations that link up. Uh, of course, it's great to have individual commitments, but if we really want to change systems and to change companies and organizations, management has to commit. And then the most important part actually was to make sure that this commitment also translate into action, actually have activities to become more inclusive in the workplace, for example. So we, we uh, realized that if we want to make that happen, we have to make sure that there is capacity on inclusion. And we built a pool of disability inclusion facilitators who were actually those same young people that were part of the learning expedition and trained and empowered them to become disability inclusion facilitators and being able to, to build capacity on inclusion with those different members of Make 12.4% Work and also make action plans together with them and make sure that there are some quick wins um, to show that step by step uh, you become more inclusive as a company, for example, um, allocate a parking lot for persons with disabilities in your in your parking space as a company. So those quick wins have been very important to actually make that commitment stick. And also uh, we talked about systems. Uh, what about your HR policies? What about your M&E frameworks? So our disability inclusion facilitators were actually able to support them in um, in having more inclusive system. So to summarize this, um, what we actually learned is that it's very important to create that yes, we can attitude to show that inclusion is possible. It's not complex and it can happen as long as you, you make it happen. We also um, realized that it's so important to build momentum and to create this pull factor for organizations to wanting to become part of such um, a network and to consolidate the commitment uh, by making managers sign up to the network. And of course, to make sure that it doesn't stop there, that you have to build and support to make that commitment uh, be translated to action and have uh, people on the ground to support that, to, to show the how of disability inclusion. And last but not least, we have to engage system actors. So not only work with those organizations, but also work with ministries, work with umbrella organizations of employers, and of course, link up uh, very closely with disability structures and do it together with them. And at the same time, also strengthen their structures uh, to make this all happen. Um, this sounds like, um, of course, a very positive story, and it is because actually um, already within the two years, we have been able to have the 124 members of the network, but we also see a lot of challenges uh, remaining. There are challenges around uh, statistics. There are challenges to have uh, sufficient documented evidence of our message about what works, but also what the challenges are. So much, many more efforts are, are needed on that. Um, we also see challenges about um, actually this leave no one behind message, because very often you are able to reach out to the common few with mild impairments, maybe often may persons with physical impairments, but what about the others with multiple impairments or uh, persons with intellectual or psychosocial impairments? We are not there yet and we have to continue to be, um, to have co-creation sessions, co-design sessions to make sure that we come up with ways to also, yeah, to leave no one behind actually. And what we saw as the drivers of all of this to actually make this happen are exactly those young people with disabilities, have them in the lead and make them, um, support them to, to be the change makers. Um, and they actually are already by, um, by being role models. So they are the drivers of change, which is um, really important. Um, then I think it's also really interesting to explore more the value of partnerships between my mainstream livelihood expert organizations and disability and development organizations and disability structures, because we feel there's much more to gain there and to really leverage with their expertise and programs and to really bring inclusion uh, to scale. Thank you very much. 
Well, thank you so much, Anneke, for sharing also your experience on uh, uh, specifically on the program Make 12.4% Work in Uganda. Just uh, out of curiosity, how many people with disabilities were you able actually to reach finally uh, in terms of providing them or supporting them in finding better economic uh, uh, opportunities to, to make a living? Yes, so I don't have the exact number at the moment here in front of me, but we have been able to reach uh, at least six and a half thousand uh, young people with disabilities. Uh, some of them in wage employment uh, and many more of them in uh, self-employment. Yeah, and then we're talking about what time frame? That You've was, yeah, so that was in a period of two years time. Fantastic, right. That is quite impressive. And our network uh, keeps on growing like every day. Yes. Yeah. So you're building a movement. That's the idea. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Anneke. Because of the time, I need to, we need to move on. Uh, let's uh, move to uh, to Masudul. Uh, we move to Dhaka, <laughs> Bangladesh. Uh, Masudul, uh, yeah, please, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Sender, and thank you, Anika, for sharing your uh, good example of what uh, Light for the Work is doing. And here in Bangladesh, like uh, we started a Disability Inclusive Poverty Graduation Project <clears throat> since uh, 2010, thanks to Bragg for their like uh, very comprehensive and consolidated uh, model that uh, they have developed through a uh, systemic and and, and uh, studies and research, so yeah, it really uh, interests us to to start working on these things. And what we actually felt when we are doing our traditional rehabilitation program by humanitarian inclusion and other uh, disability focused organization in Bangladesh, uh, and also what we have seen that other traditional livelihood organization implementing livelihood programming, and none of them really could ensure economic empowerment of people with disabilities because this silo intervention was not like uh, uh, quite I would say good enough to targeting people with disabilities. So we thought that uh, how we can blend these two program and and use the graduation model because uh, when we're talking about this intervention in Bangladesh it was around 40 percent people living below poverty. So it's really uh, important to ensure that they are graduating out of poverty and we experience that that economic inclusion is really a gateway for people with disabilities for their empowerment in the family in the community as a whole not only in terms of economical but also in other social aspect and uh, we also found that the traditional livelihood project that uh, many uh, mainstream organization is doing cannot assure that people with disabilities have a sustainable uh, a change in their life. They often fall back if, if it is not a, like a, a comprehensive and sustainable changes in their life and quality of life has been changed. So the graduation model is quite a mini big push from this like uh, to break the cycle, the poverty, uh, vicious cycle between disability and poverty. Uh, and in Handicap International, uh, we when we started, like since HI is not a um, uh, livelihood expert organization, more a disability expert organization, then we start using this uh, graduation model. So we learn a lot throughout this piloting. For instance, we really found that people with the chronic poverty really need a psycho psychological support to start a business because they do not have experience. And this is the country of disaster, natural disaster we are facing every year. Uh, several natural hazards like flood and cyclone and drought and winter and also like the earthquake. So it's really important to ensure that this is a resilience our activities and uh, and and how we can ensure the RICS fund uh, so that when there is a natural disaster they have something to cope with these shocks. And we found that uh, we need a specific focus on gender uh, mainstreaming in particularly supporting women. For instance, like we target women with disabilities, uh, women as a caregiver, women who are like prime income earner of the family. So these three categories we, we give like specific attention in our follow up projects. Uh, 
and obviously like the parents group uh, like uh, older people that also need to be targeted and savings which is also like a, a, a core component of graduation model that we also uh, strengthen and how we can bring a self-help group among this uh, most vulnerable group in the community uh, the people with disabilities living with extreme poverty and though like bangladesh is a country of microfinance institute huh? we actually uh, are, are famous uh, in terms of microfinancing but this traditional microfinance really do not include people with disabilities they are not often flexible and they do not come with like a comprehensive support so that people with disabilities uh, in particular living with extreme poverty uh, enjoy uh, the microfinances so finally after like uh, two phases of the project uh, we are right now conducting a control randomized control trial study in the in the uh, project mm -hmm. current project so that we can show an effectiveness of this model next one please and uh, next please sir and what we found actually there are lots of challenge throughout this journey to the pathway to graduation and with all the traditional and common barriers that are existing in the communities and also like people with disabilities and their families really do not see a role model in the community so they really do not have this aspiration uh, to start a new business to to give a try to uh, to the employment of our economic activities and the country as i mentioned uh, with the natural disaster and our our health system really do not have any financing model to protect extreme poor people from the financial hardship so the couple with this natural disaster and health shock really bringing this uh, extreme poor people back to this like poverty trap when we we them to to graduate out and we found that uh, priority by the mainstreaming organization, mainstreaming development actors. And then when we talk about the OPDs in Bangladesh, they really lack uh, capacity, uh, their uh, own financial sustainability or economic sustainability really a question. And also we found that uh, they are still like uh, working in a silo, their alliances is really missing. Um, so this is actually uh, really hampered this whole uh, drive, how we can, we can support them to inclusion. And the specific support that is required for persons with disabilities, the rehabilitation, the support services, uh, for instance, the uh, assistive product are not really available and affordable for uh, extreme poor people that we are targeting. In particularly, in the case of like uh, remote area or, or, or proximities. And the ways employment remain a, a big challenge in terms of access, in terms of retaining, if we manage to, to include them, uh, but but the retention is, is really a challenge and and, and the financial services uh, is really not like uh, it's it come with a, a, a microfinance package and after two weeks they start uh, taking back so the flexibility is really missing and and the, our social protection scheme that we have in Bangladesh is really like uh, is not sufficient enough in terms of uh, reaching people and 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 it is more like quantitative rather than like bringing a like quality change in their life. For instance, like uh, seven euro per, per month, which really even does not, uh, is not sufficient for their survival. So they really cannot start a new business or, or anything. And to start a, like any economic activity, the preparedness that they are required, for example, general education is really not like inclusive. So people with disability are, are almost like getting out from this general education that in a consequence uh, inhibiting them to accessing ways employment or skill training and and the chronic poverty that they are experiencing it also have a, like a long term psychosocial distress so uh, this along with this the, the market system that we have both the input and output channels that are not actually inclusive, not only for people with disabilities, but also for women or people with uh, older people. So, so it is still the information, the system uh, are, are not like friendly. And and eventually, when we are actually 
supporting women or persons with disabilities or our family uh, with children with disabilities still the ownership of that financial uh, benefit is still a question that how much ownership that women or persons with disabilities uh, have or they gain or their their voice actually hurt at the, at the families and 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 our team is still struggling with uh, reasonable accommodation particularly disabilities in particular people who are living with severe disabilities intellectual disabilities or sensorial disabilities so these are the like uh, some of the key challenges uh, along with very many operational challenges we are actually uh, facing and faced throughout our journey uh, next one please and then actually uh, this this graduation model uh, that we actually uh, inspired by Brack, and then we actually uh, pilot it, we refine it, we uh, re-pilot and modify it, and today we try to give a shape. And I can also share that uh, Brack also came to us, like asking HI to have a technical support to their programming to make their graduation program uh, inclusive. So we have a formal partnership with Brack, and we are working together uh, to make make their model inclusive. So this really give a uh, give a, a big achievement for HI uh, because the Brack they have a, a large coverage. So similarly, we are also advocating jointly to ensure government buy-in uh, in this type of model to make a sustainable change in the life of people with disabilities. So we really want that. Uh, do we really want uh, like? quantitative uh, social protection achievement or do you want to ensure the graduation uh, of, of, of extreme poor people and and throughout the journey that we we actually see in this uh, graph from the identification to ensure their uh, functional rehabilitation services to maximize their performance uh, their their functional capability and then access to skill training and the, uh, like the financial services and the market and how we are ensuring this uh, market situation and, and resilience from the plan, uh, planning to the end of this uh, project cycle, this graduation cycle, we really need a personalized support for each family, each person with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And this group of people really need a rigor rigorous follow up support. Uh, otherwise, like it's, it's really challenging. And we try to adopt a household approach uh, rather than supporting individual so we target the household as a whole because graduation is depending on the whole family, not that particular people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and bringing the whole household uh, in this uh, model is really uh, useful because they, they can they have multiple sources of income, uh, uh, self-help mechanism within the family. And it's really uh, uh, useful. And we use OPDs from the all cycle of the graduation. And we are also trying to bring these people with disabilities under the umbrella of uh, OPDs so that they can also have voice at the at the state level. And also uh, they are inspired or they are accompanied by OPDs so that their journey become more like smoother. And we, we, we always try to use the local resources rather than uh, always creating a new services. We try to link with government, we use existing services and facilities, uh, so we promote the access to service model where we try to uh, make a uh, interaction between authorities and services and users. So authorities, they ensure that their rights are uh, met. The service provider ensure that they are uh, they have the capacity and skill to work with people with disabilities and people with disabilities. They are also empowered. To, to ask for the service, to claim their rights. So this interaction we are trying to promote so that people with disabilities have access to all existing public and private facilities. Mm -hmm. And we really found that uh, from our uh, piloting to the now on that the market system is really useful for the graduation. If the market system is not uh, inclusive or friendly for people with disabilities, yeah. uh, then they cannot get the maximum benefit out of yeah. this. Uh, graduation activity and resilience uh, since this is a country of disaster and the uh, health shock. So resilience need to be considered from the beginning to the all phase of the, the projects. And last but not not least, the intersectionality of the vulnerability, yeah. because it's not only people with disabilities, people with disabilities like women, older people with disabilities, people with uh, disabilities in a minority group, 
are are like people with disabilities living in a disaster prone area so all the intersectionality really need to be uh, well assessed and our our support need to be personalized that really help them to graduate out of poverty i will stop here uh, <laughs> Thank you so uh, much, Masudul. Yeah. I think you can continue for the for at least another hour. But it's <laughs> and I think it also a lot of questions will be there because I think it's a really interesting approach and that you are uh, that you're implementing together with Brak in uh, in uh, SHI in in Bangladesh and a lot to learn from. What really struck me is actually the deep analysis that you have done in terms of how the market functions and trying to sort of build on top of the, uh, the that, that that understanding of uh, uh, the market to really systematically try to lift people out of poverty. I, I think it's very, very strong. Thank you so much, Masado. You're welcome. Simon, it's yeah. over to you uh, to, to, to share some of your experience. And um, also a bit of a, I think a bit of a different angle uh, in terms of economic empowerment, but uh, as as interesting and as important. Thanks, Andre. Yeah, and and I think it is maybe a different angle, but I, but but I get, I think the two presentations so far, the two discussion points so far, kind of get me to think actually, we we have different entry points, but a, a great consistency in what in 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 the approaches that we're taking, and and, and perhaps that will hopefully come through a little bit. Um, and and this community is quite young, of course. We've just started this 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 community uh, within the the zero project, and and hopefully others that might be listening in will want to join it as a result of this this round table. I really hope so. Um, and, and we started to think through a little bit around these levers of change um, and how we then begin to kind of present those in this in this round table. Um, and I stumbled across a, a document on the Internet from from Unilever um, around their their five levers of change, um, particularly around um, behavioral change communication within their consumer products uh, part of their business. Um, and, it, and it got me to think also around how different sectors can learn from each other around these levers of change. And I'll come back to that in, in a moment, but but I'll first talk a little bit around um, the, the, the the program that 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 I, that I want to talk about, which is called a, a program called Inclusion Works, um, which falls under this 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 label at the bottom of the, the, the presentation there called Inclusive Futures, which is a, a whole kind of broad portfolio of, of, of disability inclusion uh, uh, programs, primarily funded through UK aid. Um, and, and the project itself, so the, so the Inclusion Works project itself, really looks at labour market systems um, and how they can adapt to be far more inclusive of, of, of people with disabilities in formal employment. Now, that's really important. Yeah? It, this is about formal employment, not formal sector employment, and that links very well to what Annika was talking around and what Mazadal was talking around. Um, and, and certainly, as you were introduced, Sander, that this is not only about formal sector jobs, waged employment. Yeah, that our, that our definition is very consistent then with ILO at looking much broader at self-employment or own account working um, and, and even into farmers. Yeah, and we've touched a little bit around agriculture in, in, in the previous presentations, but how under um, uh, certain conditions, particularly around producer groups, that, that farmers can, can move into formal employment um, as they uh, access higher value parts of the of the market system. Uh, but where do we start? And I think this is a, this is an important um, guidance, I hope, to other programs. And again, very consistent with with Annika's approach, but also but, uh, with with Mazadol's, and, and it's to invest in understanding the system before trying to facilitate change in it. And we spent a lot of time 18 months ago when we started this work. Of, of of analyzing how that system functions and, and dysfunctions in terms of inclusion. And what we came out with was some surprising kind of findings that, that really challenged the assumptions we were making around exclusion. Um, and what we found is that by and large, employers in labor markets do want to be inclusive. Um, and many have tried and and often almost all have failed. 
um, by their own words, yeah, that, that they really struggled and, and realizing that actually they're, they're, they lack a lot of confidence around disability. Now, this is not all employers, of course, not every single company in the world wants to be inclusive, but there are a lot of companies which are aspirational. Yeah, and, and how we then recognize that lack of confidence, but at the same time, uh, recognize the, 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 um, the, the self-confidence um, and, and the influence of societal stigmas on job seekers with disabilities and how the internalizing of those stigmas from, from communities, from education systems, sometimes from even families, that aspirations should be very limited to, to more to work that's more felt more appropriate to people with disabilities J jobs like dressmaking or shoemaking um and the, and and then and and how that gets internalized and and causes people with disabilities not to apply then for opportunities for more formal employment so we begin to recognize and get a much better understanding then of how the labor market functions and dysfunctions and where we went from that on the next slide is to then start looking at well how Going back to, to what Unilever was kind of saying around their levers of change, one of them being make it easy, or make it easier or make it easy. Yeah? And that's one of the, the key things that we've adopted in the program as, as one of these levers of change, whether that be investing some of our time in creating resources that help companies begin to address then that lack of confidence. And we built and launched at the end of last year. The, the Employer's Disability Confidence Toolkit. Uh, we launched it with, with ILO in, in November and it's available and I'll come back to the website in a minute. You can go and find it. But, but just try to, to create uh, solutions that are accessible to employers and are, are easy uh, or make it easier for them to become more confident. That's the first part I would, I would suggest that in terms of our intervention. On the next slide, we also then begin to make it easier for job seekers to access pathways which get them the skills and the confidence. Now that might be, for example, here on this screen, accessing online systems like the system we, we're partnering with Accenture Skills to Succeed program on developing job seeker skills or some of these kind of uh, confident skills or accessing mentors. We have a great approach in Nigeria, for example, of, of, of part of pairing job seekers with experienced HR professionals to start to build up this self-confidence and start to break down those barriers of, of, of the internalized stigma. That's yeah, so again, making it easier, making it more accessible for, for, for job seekers, but also then starting to address the, the system itself on the next slide and recognizing that we have to, and this again is very consistent with what Annika has, has been saying, and Sandra, you also have said about Mazadal's presentation, you've got to work on the system. And this, I think, is one of the biggest challenges for us all, is to work within the system and not to what I call ghost it or duplicate it. Yeah, that, and, and, and if I look at those disability inclusion facilitators, how we're, because we do work together with, with Annika's team in Uganda, how they become part of the system and are sustained in the system and are not dependent then on the on the length of a particular project yeah we're changing the system yeah so we look then at things like the national business and disability networks and how we build that capacity through the disability organizations who are members of those networks to work with employers using those resources to build their confidence and that is that to me is both the biggest challenge or one of the biggest challenges, but also one of the biggest opportunities. Yeah, and I, and I won't duplicate what others have said around uh, leave no one behind and 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 the the, the gender equity and, and equality within the labour market systems. I will focus on on this of, of working within the system. And finally, I want to just give a a, a little conversation around value chains. And again, it's, it's very consistent with, with, with the, the work that Mazadol is talking around. If we take that that approach of saying what well, Formal employment is much more than formal sector employment. We begin to open up a much bigger system. Yeah, yeah? And, if, and some of the work we're doing, for example, here with, with uh, the Diageo company, East Africa Breweries Limited in Kenya, um, of really then looking at, at the whole value chain and how we then work with the company and support its aspiration of a certain percentage of all jobs in that whole system 
being filled by by people with disabilities then creates massive opportunity not just constr uh, 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 constricted to, to formal sector largely in urban spaces but also in rural contexts and at different levels of educational achievement um, and, and it then engenders much more inclusion so I'm going to leave it there and just say if you want to find out more um, about inclusion works then do go to www.inclusivefutures.org slash work and you'll find a whole bunch of stuff in there that explains the program and you'll also find that disability uh, toolkit for employers but that's that's what I would stop at thanks Sander thanks so much Simon uh, and very interesting also to to see yeah, the the way how you have approached it and also how you link the uh, the, the work that you have been doing uh, also uh, with the insights that Masadul and Annika already brought up uh, especially the last part about the value chains and I think that is also a huge area of of, uh, of potential you know talking about a market demand supply you know what is core business for 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 companies i think this is core business yes. uh, and if we want to make a difference in terms of economic opportunities for people with disabilities then we need to work at that level yeah so yeah <laughs> feel very strongly about it as well um what i liked when i listened to you all i think a couple of things really came to me one is the system really and a system understanding and not only thinking about our intervention as a sort of a standalone or with a very sort of uh, restricted time frame, but in a very much broader perspective, really. Eh? Uh, Annika, the way you talk about it, but also Masudul and also you, Simon, eh? you talk about really a long term initiative eh? where you want to make changes and you have a very sort of concerted way to sort of approach it to analyze it and then actually to to make your choices in it and um the thing around uh, yes we can make inclusion possible and eh? yes we can make it easy uh, yeah, yes there is a sort of a pathway you know you really make it very clear in terms of your communication that it's possible we can do it and you show the way how and i think that's uh, and all the three uh, the experiences that you shared, that comes out very clearly. Um, also, what I liked uh, uh, is the the aspect of yes, working with mainstream organisations, with microfinance institutes, with companies, with uh, with livelihood pr uh, program actors, but also with people with disabilities themselves, both as change agents, mm -hmm. but also when it comes to uh, psycho uh yeah psychosocial uh, uh development uh, of people and also how they uh sort of uh, uh, work uh, also in terms of their resilience so i really like that that you really sort of um uh, actually uh, approach both of them uh, both the mainstream organizations persons with disabilities in the same goal and really brought it together yeah so thank you so much and i'm i'm um I'm confident that there are a lot of uh, questions now coming up uh, from the audience. So let's uh, have a look at the, the, those questions and then uh, uh, try to answer them. And uh, thank you so much uh, for now, uh, uh, both Anneke, Masudul and Simon. Thank you. Thank you.